Good morning to those out west and a good afternoon to those that are here in uh, Warden. Certainly want to extend a warm welcome to everybody. I'm glad everybody could make it in today. And a, uh, I know we've got a good number out in the Vancouver area today with uh, Tom and Rachel and Nicole and Ian. And not to leave out my wonderful, lovely wife who's uh, taking a trip up to the Northwest to see the beams and, and others up there. Well, brethren, it is time to begin services and to do this worship of our great creator God. So we will begin services. I will ask Mr. Eric Lee to come forward and open the services with prayer. Father in heaven, Father, thank you so much for the Sabbath day and thank you, Father, for bringing us here safely and thank you, Father, for this glimpse you've given us into your plan and please help us just to continue to grow in, in the knowledge of that plan and please, Father, help us to grow closer to you and please, Father, inspire the speaking day as well as our hearing and be with all your people. Please especially be with those that are sick and just there's many of your people right now that are going through trials and be with them and comfort them and help them to have a joyful Sabbath. And please, Father, just be with all your people around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, brethren, it is now time for song service. So if you'll take your hymnals, turn with me in the older hymnals, it's page number 22. In the newer hymnals, it's page number 47. So 22 in the old, 47 in the new, to thee I lift my soul. great beginning for our second hymn if you'll turn over to page number 66 in the older hymnals that's page number 93 in the newer hymnals 66 in the old 93 in the in the newer hymnals O Lord of hosts my King my God
our third hymn. If you'll turn over just a few pages to page number 78 in the older hymnals. That's page number 116 in the newer hymnals. 78 in the old, 116 in the new. He shall reign forevermore. Brethren, if you'll all please be seated, we will now have the main message for today, Mr. Steve Buchanan. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Great to see everyone here. Greetings to those who may be watching. Hello to those out west. Great to have all of you with us. Quite a crowd out there. Greetings to Tom and Rachel and Jules and Addie and uh, having Nicole and Ian in there visiting, all those little ones getting along, I'm sure. And uh, seems like I'm missing somebody. Oh, yeah, Carlene. I told her, I, I texted her before I started. I said, now, no matter what I say up there, you can't reveal what my middle name is, but I guarantee you she's using it right about now. <laughs> anyway. Greetings to everybody. Hopefully everybody's just having a great Sabbath. I'd like to begin today by asking if you would turn to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4. We know that the epistles to Timothy from the Apostle Paul are instructions from an apostle to a younger minister. And it consists in a lot of places of specific warnings that are given. In chapter 4, we're going to read several different uh, three sections of Scripture fairly rapidly, Scriptures that we're all familiar with that are prophecies concerning the end of days. 1 Timothy chapter 4, we'll begin reading here with verse 1. It says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, that Greek word can be tra translated as later or as it is here, latter, so it's, it's pertaining to the, toward the end of the age, latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, that last part from the New English Bible, subversive doctrines inspired by demons. So we see here that 
what's prophesied to occur, that there's a lot of ideas, a lot of teachings that take place that appear to be coming from men, that appear to be coming perhaps from organizations, but inspired by Satan and his demons. As we know full well, our battle lies on a spiritual realm. We understand that. Verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy. So they speak one thing, do another thing. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. So in other words, they're able to do something, they're able to say something, not follow through and practice it, but their conscience doesn't eat at them any longer. No longer do they feel guilty for sinning. Their conscience is seared with a hot iron. Verse 3, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Words that are to be used as nourishment for those who understand the truth. If you go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, Second Timothy chapter 3, we'll begin reading here with verse 1. It says, but know this, that in the last days, this word for last, the Greek word means the farthest or the final. So we're talking about the end of the latter days, right before the return of Christ. Know this, that in the last days, perilous times or stressful times will come. Now, as we read that, I think it's very obvious that it will be stressful for God's people. We understand that. But as I look around the world today, just in what we see, it can be stressful on a physical level in a lot of different areas for people who don't even understand the truth. There's a lot of stress that it's out there, but I believe that this holds most value for those who understand the truth. A lot of things that are going to happen that are going to provide temptation for those who understand the truth to walk a different way. Going on, verse 2. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Notice some of these things. This lovers of money is going to be something that we'll refer to in just a second. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, not respectful of authority, unthankful, unholy, ungodly, unloving, unforgiving. The margin in my Bible, I like the rendering there, it says irreconcilable. In other words, it's not just about forgiving someone, but there's no peace between people. It's not a reconcilable situation. Somebody, something is preventing reconciliation between people. Unforgiving, slanderers, assassin assassination of character of others, without self-control, no longer are they aware of what they're doing and they are controlling their actions, their thoughts, their words, but they're being influenced by everything around them and they're not bringing everything under control. Brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. As the New English Bible translates it, men who preserve the outward form of religion, but are a standing denial of its reality. The fruits of their life do not show truth. And it ends verse 5. This is a direction to us. All of these descriptions, and from such people, turn away. Don't be influenced by it. Don't be impacted by it. Don't allow your vision, your purpose, to be adversely affected. 
The third section, if you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, First Thessalonians chapter 5, we'll begin here with verse 1. It says, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. We could say today, anybody could say amongst the people of God, concerning times and seasons, we don't even need to bring it up. We should all understand the times in which we live. We should all be able to see the fruits all around us and the temptations that are on a daily basis impacting us. For Verse 2, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. And when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. Talking about the end of this age, God's judgment on this world, comparing it to pregnancy here. In other words, once we reach the moment for the day of the Lord, for the end to begin, the prophecies cannot be stopped. Just like a pregnancy, once the baby starts to come, it can't be stopped. Once we reach this point in history and the prophecies must begin, God will not stop them. It must continue. It ends and they shall not escape. Verse 4, But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. God has revealed to us what he plans to do ahead of time, perhaps not in explicit detail, but we have an outline of what God is planning to do, and this day should not overtake us as a thief in the night. By looking at other scriptures, we should be able to see the figs beginning to form on the tree. We should know that the end of this age is near, and thereby we need to be aware and diligent concerning our frame of mind and our heart. Verse 5, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. You are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober or as the margin has in my Bible, self-controlled. Aware of your surroundings, controlling your thoughts, your purpose in life, your emotions. These three sections of Scripture that we have read, all of us are extremely familiar with. They are warnings in many cases that we could have repeated verbatim. We understand what the words say. What I want to begin to think about today is going to be the impact all of this will have on us as individuals. I want to begin to think about are we prepared for the end of this age. I want to go back to Genesis chapter 25. There's a particular section of scripture here. Again, we're very familiar with, but we're going to read a little bit of the account here, and then we'll move on from here. Chapter 25, verse 19. It says, this is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as wife the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah his wife conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Situation where Isaac went, pleaded with God. God blessed them in exactly what they wanted. 
but things are not progressing in a normal way. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth, indeed, there were twins in her womb. And the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So he waited 20 years, they waited 20 years after being married for these children to be born. Verse 27, so the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man, dwelling in tents. If we look at just this brief description, we would say that Esau was very gifted in physical means. He may have been somebody who was very industrious, could get a lot of things done. He was respected for that aspect of who he was. Jacob might have been seen more like a homebody, taking things, care of things more around the house. Verse 28, and Isaac loved or favored Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved or favored Jacob. Again, now we're familiar with this, but we see many mistakes, several mistakes throughout the family line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and it will occur in this area of favoring children over others. We could go back and we could look at the situation with Abraham and Sarah, how they took it in their own wherewithal to try to fulfill what God had promised by having Abraham go into Hagar and have a child born to them. It was their way of trying to work out what God promised. They took it to themselves to do it. But when it happened, God did not favor Ishmael. And the birthright blessing was given to Isaac at a later date. But this idea of favoring one over the other and some feeling slighted because of it begins there. With Isaac and Rebekah taking it upon themselves to favor one or the other, it breeds problems within the family. And there was a situation here, and it didn't stop here. As we know, it goes on to Jacob as he favored Joseph and the competition that it brewed in the family line. Going on to verse 29, it says, Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I am about to die. As we read through this, as we look just a cursory reading, we could see that perhaps Esau was out in the field. He came in, he was tired and hungry, and just asked for a bowl of food. This is an extreme situation. Perhaps Esau had been gone for many days. Perhaps he had been without food for several days. He was extremely hungry. In his view, he was starving. He needed something to eat. This was the situation he was faced with. So so he said to himself, so what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, swear to me or take an oath to me as of this day, So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Or he did not value it as he should. Unlike the three sections of scripture that we began with, this warning... As we're going to see, this example is a very simple example within a family between two brothers, just two individuals. We could pause at several points and begin to isolate, think deeper about, and come up with lessons that we could learn from. 
But it's this particular example that's quoted later in Scripture that I want to turn to now. If you'll go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to begin reading, breaking into the thought. We're going to read beginning with verse 14. It says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance though he sought it diligently with tears. This is a section of scripture that begins to talk about a subject that we're going to spend time with today. And all of the scriptures that we have read up to this point is going to have a bearing on it. We're going to delve into what is noted here as a root of bitterness. Just in the example that we have noted here in Hebrews 12, just looking at the example between Esau and Jacob, I think all of us, if we just looked at that, we could define the root of bitterness as one person having a problem with another person, feeling slighted by another person, and feeling problems because of that. Considering the times in which we live, what God will allow his people to suffer and be afflicted by, this is going to be a far-reaching topic much further than what a cursory reading will give to us and very important warning for all of us as we look forward to the return of Jesus Christ. Because what we will endure will be emotionally and physically traumatic at times. And the dangers for a root of bitterness to take place in us is real. The temptations are going to be there. And as we look deeper into this, as I have had more time than all of you recently to look into this, as I've seen in my life, There have been many, many, many times where a root of bitterness can take place, can begin in us. It's something that we need to take seriously, we need to be diligent about, and not allow it to begin or to affect our lives. So the title of this sermon is The Danger of a Root of Bitterness. When you hear the term root of bitterness. What is the definition that you would give for it? Perhaps as we would go around the room, perhaps it would differ. I think that, again, as we just look at these verses, our definition can be limited. But as we're going to see, there are two specific sections of Scripture, this being one, that we're going to look at a little closer. But I want to begin by looking at the meaning of these words. This word root is the Greek word R-H-I-Z-A. And it means exactly what you would think it does. There's no alternate meanings. It means a root. When you think of a root, it doesn't matter what type of a plant you're thinking of, whether it's a flower, whether it's a blade of grass, Whether it's a tree, it doesn't matter. What is the purpose of the root? The root dives into the ground. It's going to provide support for whatever grows out of it. It's going to provide support and it's going to take in nourishment, nutrients, water, 
for the sake of the plant. In other words, any root affects the entire plant. Everything a root takes in will affect the plant and certainly will affect every piece of fruit that comes forth from that plant, whether the fruit is a flower, whether the fruit is a leaf, whether the fruit is actually a fruit or a vegetable. Whatever the root takes in feeds the plant. It gives support for the plant, but it feeds the plant to give it nourishment. There's other ways for a plant to be fed. They can, they can be fed by moisture that comes from the air. They can take things by photosynthesis. But the root is the primary source that it uses. If you go back to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. going to break into the thought. We're just going to read verse 10. It will use the same Greek word that is translated as root. It says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So already we can see that we're talking about something that's not just a, a feeling of hurt between two individuals. If we look at just the example of Esau and Jacob, this, this extends far beyond just a relationship situation. Esau and Jacob are certainly included in that discussion, but it's not limited to that. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So we're talking about a pursuit. We're talking about an obsession. We're talking about something that dominates the time, the mind, the thoughts, the planning, Everything that a person will invest is described here as a root. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness. So, this example of a love of money being a root that drives down begins to give support for a way of life that's ungodly. It begins to give support for a way of life that God would look at and see fruits that he would judge as bitterness, that he would judge as poison. This is what is, is beginning to get getting crossed here. Have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So as we see here, this root of bitterness can take many forms, this root can. The Greek word that was translated as bitterness is pikria, P-I-K-R-I-A. And it means an acidity, especially poison, literally or figuratively bitterness. So we, again, we have this picture painted that this root dives down. It begins to feed the plant with stuff that affects the fruit, and the fruit is poison. You can already begin to think in your mind, we're not going to turn to the scripture, but Christ stated plainly, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit. A bad tree cannot produce good fruit. As we see the root, the pursuit, the domination of our time and our thoughts is what's going to produce the fruit that we're going to show in our lives. If you'll turn to Acts chapter 8. The bitterness that's talked about represents the fruit. Acts chapter 8. We're going to begin reading here with verse 14. It says, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God... They sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come, come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet it had fallen upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of Lord Jesus. This is almost a controversial area of scripture because there are some people who like to argue that individuals such as deacons can baptize. 
In this situation, the administration was deacons actually took and immersed people. But as these scriptures plainly state, it takes the eldership to be able to lay hands on for God to honor and to grant his spirit. Verse 17, then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. They had previously been baptized. They had been immersed by someone else, but it was somebody who had not been given the authority by God to lay hands on for the Spirit to be given. Now, I want to point out, and we all know this, God is the only one who can give His Spirit. But God details the process by which He will honor. And it's through this means. Verse 18, And when Simon, this is going to be Simon Magus, saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. He wanted to purchase the gift that God had granted these apostles. Verse 20, But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. He is beginning to get to the root behind Simon Magus' fruits that he could see. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, And pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. He saw the fruits as poison. He saw that it could be something that not only affected Simon Magus, but as he talked, as he expressed these thoughts, other people could partake of that fruit, that bitterness, and be affected by it. He could see that. Simon Magus tried to purchase the power that God granted by grace. The bitterness that Peter could see was the fruit of the root in Simon Magus, the pursuit that he had. If you'll please go back to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. This time I want to begin with verse 13. It says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct. In other words, the fruits that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. And the inference here is that it's the wisdom from God. It's not going to be a worldly wisdom, but it's going to be wisdom that God has to grant and teach. Verse 14, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts. If that is a purpose, if that is a root that's beginning to give support for your way of life, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, or as the New International Revised Standard have, it's unspiritual, it's demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. So he's saying the root, if the purpose, if what you're driving for is envy and self-seeking, he talks about confusion as a result. As we look around the earth today, as we look at what we're able to see and we're impacted by, we see the reasoning of many calling black white, calling good evil. We see confusion. We see a disorientation among them. 
What James begins to point out here is this process takes place, the reasoning of people become more deluded. It gets to the point where, again, they call good evil and evil good. The choice for this way of life, the choice for envy and self-seeking is after the lead of Satan and his demons. And the bottom line is it is a work against God. That is one of the main priorities we are going to see, that this root, this purpose, this work is against God. The purpose and motives behind this will work against God's purpose, work against what God wants to build in us. Eventually, unrepented of, this way of life will lead one to again become disoriented to the point of justifying their actions and saying that it will be acceptable to God. Again, the reasoning will become distorted. The picture that is painted is that a root feeds the plant. The plant produces fruit by what it feeds on and what it's nourished by. Spiritually, the heart and main purpose that an individual pursues feeds everything produced by that individual and the fruit will be seen and judged by God to be righteous or poison. Two choices. Again, that's all we have. I think it would help to go through the entire context of Hebrews chapter 12 in order to see what God wants to get across. But before we do that, there is one Old Testament section of Scripture that in my eyes and in my studies gives a much clearer picture and we will see increases the scope of what a root of bitterness is and what it can do to us. If you'll turn to Deuteronomy chapter 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29. This is going to be a section of Scripture that begins to conclude after the giving of reminding Israel of the laws, the statutes, and just in the chapter previous, the blessings and cursings. God is reminding Israel of the covenant that he is entering into with them. Chapter 29, verse 1. These are the words of the covenant. Again, this is a summary. He's gone over so much. These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab besides the covenant which he made with them in Horeb. Now Moses called all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh, to all of his servants, to all his land. The great trials which your eyes have seen, the signs and those great wonders. Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive or understand, and eyes to see and ears to hear, to this very day. Ancient Israel saw it all. They benefited from it all. But they were not given God's spirit for that root spiritually to be established firm in them. And it was by God's purpose that it worked this way. Verse 5. And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out on you and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. You have not eaten bread, nor have you drunk wine or similar drink, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. This is a personal, individual statement here. And for each of us, as we think of this and place ourselves in this arena, we can look at all that God has done to make possible us to understand the truth that we do, all of the miracles that he has performed to bring us out from a way of sin to open up to us a pathway by which we can learn of the character of God himself. 
This is what God has done for us, and it comes down to so that we may know that He is our God. He's my God. He's your God. It's personal. He loves you. You love Him. That's a, that's a very personal thing. Verse 7, And when you came to this place, Sion, king of Heshbon, and Og, king of Bashan, came out against us to battle, and we conquered them. We took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites, to the Gadites, and to half the tribe of Manasseh. Therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do. Everything that's been listed up to here was all that God had provided. It's very easy to stop there. It's very easy to say, God called me. God brought me into the church. He understood all that I was. He'll take me just this way because he called me this way. He knows what I am. He'll take me this way. It can be very easy to come to that reasoning. But verse 9 states very clearly that God expects responsibility on our part that we must continue in His words. We must continue in the truth. In other words, to be changed and cleansed as we're going to come to see. Verse 10, All of you stand today before the Lord your God, your leaders and your tribes, and your elders, and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones, and your wives, also the stranger who is in your camp, from the one who cuts your wood to the one who draws your water, that you may enter into covenant with the Lord again, your God, and into his oath which the Lord your God makes with you today, that he may establish you today as a people for himself, and that he may be God to you, just as he has spoken to you, and just as he has sworn to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I make this covenant and this oath, not with you alone, but with him who stands here with us today, before the Lord our God, as well as with him who is not here with us today. For you know that we dwelt in the land of Egypt, that we came through the nations which you passed by, and you saw their abominations and their idols which were among them, wood and stone and silver and gold. So he's talking about the nation of Egypt where they saw all of their gods. He's talking about the nations that they have passed in their journeys as he he says, all of you were able to witness how these nations serve their gods, how these nations live their lives. You have seen the fruits of all of them. Verse 18, so that there may not be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord your God to go and serve the gods of these nations and that there may not be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. God makes it extremely clear here that the root is working against God. The root that bears bitterness, the, the bitterness and the fruit that can come from it is working against God. Again, it's much more than just Esau against Jacob. It's much more than that. Verse 19, And so it may not happen when he hears the words of this curse. He's talking about someone whose heart has turned from God. No longer is the mind dominated by the purpose God's revealed. No longer is it God's truth that is being thought on and meditated on and followed, but something else has replaced it. And it can be a whole host of things that that could be. But something else has replaced it. Verse 19, if it continues, and so it may not happen when he hears the words of this curse that he blesses himself in his heart. He could hear the curse, but it's not going to have any effect on him. 
He blesses himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, even though I follow the dictates of my heart, as though the drunkard could be included with the sober, as if the righteous could be included with the unrighteous. As we've already seen, the reasoning becomes so disoriented that this individual will come to the point to believe that God will accept me just the way I am. I am okay. I will be acceptable to God. This is the reasoning that a root of bitterness can provide over time. Verse 20, God makes it extremely clear. The Lord would not spare him, for then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy would burn against that man, and every curse that is written in this book would settle on him, and the Lord would blot out his name from under heaven. God makes crystal clear his view, his perspective of a root of bitterness unrepented of. For anyone whose heart takes him to the point to begin to reason that God would accept the drunkard with the sober. Again, as we look around today at the effects of the world and what they're doing, we can see the reasoning of people making no sense. We see it. We have it in front of us. It's proof. We're going through the nations just like Israel passed through nations and saw the way they worship their gods. They saw the fruits of it. We are able to see the fruits of it. Do we see this as a real danger for us? Do we hear the warnings that God provides in His Word that could become reality if we are not staying diligent and alert to the temptations that are everywhere because we too could come to a point to think that we are acceptable when we may not be. God warns them to not allow their hearts to abandon God and choose to turn to other gods, other purposes for the direction of their lives. Moses describes this as their heart turning away from God and moving to follow other gods as a root bearing bitterness. Again, this is against God. This is spiritual. This is much more than just one person against another. This choice will produce not only poisonous or bitter fruit for that individual who buries that root and pursues it, but everyone they come into contact with will have the opportunity of partaking of that fruit and following that way of life. Can we see the warnings, the reality for God's people today? Can we see the reality as we move forward toward the very last days? when all of the descriptions we began with today become very evident all around us. We've got so much there now. There's so much evil happening all around us and we are tempted to think like they do. We're tempted to react like they do with anger, with hatred, with vengeance. When God talks of a completely different way of life. Completely different. Can we be affected by this and bury a root that's producing fruit even today that we may not recognize? I want to go back to Hebrews 12 and now I want to go into this chapter. 
based on what we've studied so far that God has contained in his word, I want to look at chapter 12. Beginning with verse 1. It says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, we understand this follows Hebrews 11, which lists several individuals whose lives demonstrated fruits that God labeled as pure, true faith. They developed over their lives. None of those people were perfect. And all of those people made mistakes. There were times in their lives that all of them had a root in their life that took them a different way, that they had to uproot. They had to get out. God had to do it, but they had to make choices along the way to allow him to do it. But there were good things that happened to them. There were blessings they experienced, but some of them had to give their lives to defend that truth, not to desert it, not to bend their knee to some other God, but they had to remain firm in their lives. It goes on, let us lay aside every weight that is going to be something that weighs us down, something that hinders us from obeying God. It's not necessarily a sin but it's something that weighs us down, that slows us down from saying yes, sir, and doing it. It goes on, it says, and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And brethren, every single one of us have something that's very easy for us to be ensnared by. Every single one. So there's none of us that can be proud. There's none of us that can stick our chest out and say we're better than others. But as, again, as I've had time to think more deeply about this, there have been many times in my life I had a root, I had a purpose, a mission that took priority over God, that God had to show me, that God had to make evident to me. And as he did, I was given a choice. Who am I going to follow? Am I going to follow the dictates of my heart or am I going to follow God? All of us, if you have that one sin that you struggle with, that one battle that you think you overcome and all of a sudden something happens and it rears its head again, you've still got a root that you've got to get out. All of us have those things that we're easily ensnared by. It goes on to say, and let us run with endurance or perseverance the race that is set before us. And this race that we're running, it's keeping the word of God. It's not straying from it, but through all the obstacles of the race, whatever it is, and it can be very individual for us, what one person faces, what one person struggles with is different than another person. Some person, it can seem, can struggle so much in certain areas where others may not, but they struggle in ways that others may not. God knows and has us in training to learn how to think and act and react like God does. He's putting us through this as we're going to see. Let us run with endurance or perseverance the race that is set before us. We don't set it before ourselves. God is the one who is going to make sure we experience what we do. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, I think, in thinking this through, this joy is going to represent the root of, of Jesus Christ, the mission that he had. The joy that that represented was certainly fulfilling the will of his Father. But it was so much more than that because that joy that he had was creating a pathway whereby all of humanity had the opportunity to be saved. 
that was a purpose in him. That was something he fought for. And he knew that he had to continue along the lines of the character that he had always had alongside his father, that he had seen from the throne room of God. He understood that. He had to stick with that. Although he had to go through that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, And as he went through all of that, keeping everything in focus, not allowing himself to be tempted and following it, has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is our example. He has shown us what we need to do. Verse 3, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Again, I began this by reading those prophecies because it expresses what reality God grants us to understand of what's coming. How are we as individuals going to be impacted by it? What is the persecution that we are going to face? How real will it be Will you or I be discouraged to allow some emotion, some feeling to take hold and we begin to pursue it? Whether it be a vengeance, whether it be a hatred, whatever it is, that we begin to pursue it and we depart from God. Again, that is the priority that God places on this term, that we depart from God. Our heart turns from God and is centered on another God, another purpose. If we don't take time to consider Jesus Christ, what he did, the pattern that we have to follow, it's very possible that we can become weary and discouraged by what God allows to happen to us. It goes on, verse 4. You have not resisted to bloodshed striving against sin. That was true for these individuals as Paul wrote this. It's true for us in our day. We haven't resisted to bloodshed yet. We haven't had somebody show up with a gun at our door. Not yet. Verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. Here's going to be an encouragement. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Do not despise the discipline. Do not despise the correction that God allows. All of the events that happen in our life, God is extremely aware of everything that happens to us. And everything is intended for a purpose. As it gives here as a father toward his children. This is what it is. My son, do not despise the correction, the discipline of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Why does he allow it? To get rid of all of these individual roots that can get in the way of our worship of God of the mission and the purpose God expects from us as individuals. Verse 7, if you endure this type of chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? God does it for the purpose again of cleansing us of sin. God is not going to put us through something to see us hurt for no reason. What human father would ever do that to his children? God loves us far more than any human father can. He would never allow us to experience pain unless there was a purpose for it. The thing that we have to develop over time is learning and have faith in God to supply that that all things are from him, that there is something that we have to learn. Verse 8, But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, 
We have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? In other words, allow Him to work what He's doing. Have faith that there is purpose in it. Have faith and belief in God and allow it to grow. And we will end up seeing God's purpose. Verse 10, for they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness, his character. This is what God is striving for. This is what he's cleansing in us so that we come to have his perspective, his heart, his mind, the truth of God on the tip of our tongues that our hands work for. Partakers of his holiness. Keep that in mind because we're going to come back to this aspect. Verse 11. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. Look at those individuals who are suffering physically on our prayer lists. I don't want to single any out. But we all know, even locally here, of those who are doing that. No chastening seems joyful. It hurts. It's painful. And it hurts to be cleansed. And all of us are going to experience aspects of that. No chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward... It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Again, thinking back to Jesus Christ, he had this joy, this root, this mission and purpose so much imprinted on his character that he went through and experienced the scourging and the beatings and the crucifixion and the sacrifice, all that was required that which he cried tears as if they were great drops of blood, the sweat that poured forth from him, that affected him. It was real for him. The stress that will come to God's people at the last days. Is it anything that will cause our heart to be turned from God for any reason? Verse 12 He goes on to say, with that picture being painted, strengthen the hands which hang down in the feeble knees. All of us are physical. All of us have limits that we can reach probably further than we thought we could. A lot of us are being asked to do things perhaps more than we ever thought we could. Some are suffering more than they ever thought they could. This encouragement here is for all of us to help each other to remain focused, not to allow the heart to be discouraged, not to allow the heart to go a different direction, but to help each other and remind each other why we're here. Help each other, encourage one another, build one another up. This is the family that God desires to build in us. This family atmosphere. Strengthen the hands which hang down in the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. God is the only one who can show us what a straight path is. But it says here that once he does that, it's our choice to make our own individual paths straight. We have to choose to follow, however hard that might be. We have got to follow in the midst of all that can happen from the outside. We must keep the focus on the straight path for our feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. In other words, cleansed. Cleansed from sin. All effects of it. Verse 14 We could spend an entire sermon on this next phrase. Pursue peace with all people. Think about your own life. 
Think about all the things that have happened to you in your life. Perhaps all those moments where you might have been angry, that you wanted to seek punishment for somebody. You wanted people to be noted for what they did to you. Do we truly pursue peace with all people? doesn't say just people in the church. It says with all people. Again, we can pause here. Peace between two people can only occur when both people make it possible. But one person can do everything they can if another person doesn't want peace, you're not going to experience it. Again, think about the life of Christ. He strove to pursue, pursue peace for all. He tried to help everyone that he came into contact with. But the end of his life was the picture of an individual who didn't even appear like a man. He did not experience peace, not here on earth. But he pursued peace with all to the level that he could. Again, ask yourself. This is an examination of yourself. Do all of us pursue peace with all? Do we do everything that we can? Or have we justified in our own mind that it's okay to feel the hatred or the vengeance towards somebody because of what they did to you? Without remembering that it's God who is the judge of all. It's not up to us to judge. God is the one who will do that. And he will in his time. But even then, our feelings should be that we want the best for that individual, that when God does judge them, that they would be come back to repentance, that God would forgive them, and that their paths could be made straight. I say because we are all in training to learn how to be members of the family of God. It's not just a title. It's not just abilities that we will be given. This is a functioning, real position within the family of God where we are going to have to work to forgive. We're going to have to desire to forgive and to straighten paths and to help people. Again, as you think this through, remembering back to Christ... He died for us while we were still sinners. He died for us before we had any knowledge of who he was. But he loved each of us to the point of making it possible for us to have a hope for life. He, they are training us to be part of that family. Pursue peace with all people and pursue holiness. Remember back up in verse 10 that we may be partakers of His holiness. Another part of the root that we are supposed to be diving down to help support our lives is that we are pursuing holiness. We're pursuing the heart and mind of Jesus Christ. That has got to be a primary mission every single day. That's got to be behind our prayers. That's got to be behind our studies. It goes on to say, without which, the pursuing peace with all people and the pursuing holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. If you don't see the Lord, you're not going to try to be like the Lord. You have to see Him. You have to come to knowing. That's what God and Christ are working toward. Verse 15, looking carefully or being diligent lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. We're going to come back and we're going to focus on that particular statement. Again, in a cursory reading, we can read right over that. We think we understand it. But the warnings and the danger in that is real for all of us. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. We have seen the wide scope that a root of bitterness can take. It can be so many things within our lives. And by this, many become defiled, whether it's the roots in their own life or the partaking of roots of, so, of fruit from somebody else to by which they begin to establish a root in their own life. 
verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau. Again, if we, uh, the cursory reading, if we just want to focus on the selling of the birthright, we can do that. But Paul talks here of the root in Esau. He was a profane person. There were many things that happened in his life whereby he showed he was going to follow the dictates of his life. Just one example. He married several Canaanite women, even though God instructed him to marry of your own people. But Esau determined that it was okay for him to operate by the dictates of his own heart. To the point that he reasoned for one morsel of food to sell his birthright. His orientation, his reasoning, his thinking no longer made sense. The root that Esau had established in his life led him to this point. This one event is not the only thing discussed, but it was the root in Esau that was profane. God saw it. It produced bitterness in his life. It produced an attitude and a frame of mind whereby he thought and reasoned that for one bowl of food that he could trade his birthright for it and that it was fine. Perhaps reasoning... God would still accept him as the eldest. God would still accept him for the birthright promise. His reasoning was altered. Verse 17, For you know that afterward when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. As I've mentioned several times, as I am reminding myself, as I study God's scriptures and all that I experience in my life, God is training us to be members of his family. And this is not easy. This is going to be hard. And the reason it's going to be hard, again, as I examine my life and I come to this conclusion, it's hard because sometimes it's hard to give up what your heart may desire. Why do I struggle with some of these things I can't quite seem to put down? Because there's still something in me that desires it. There's still something in me that reacts that way. That I have to go to God. That I have to repent. I have to acknowledge my sins. I have to repent. I have to ask God to help me root out that sin. To get it completely out from me. As we begin to conclude, I want to go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. Going to have to hurry. Verse 6. We know these verses. In this you greatly rejoice, though now, for a little while, if need be, You have been grieved by various trials. We never think we need trials. This is speaking of God's perspective. God is the one who sees that we need to experience what we do. He is the one in control. It's in Him that we have to have faith. It has to be growing for us to continue to experience and pursue what God intends. Verse 5, we go through all of this that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Is the joy that is in you, will it see you through whatever God has determined you must face? It did for Christ. That joy was real. He would not give it up no matter what it was that he had to face. Back to Hebrews chapter 12. I mentioned before this falling short of the grace of God. Paul goes on in verse 18. says, For you, 
speaking to those Hebrews at that time, after the Holy Spirit had been given, he could be the same thing as telling each of us, speaking to us as individuals, you have not come to the mountain that may be touched, that burned with fire into blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. We've read this many times where we could go back to Mount Sinai where the word came down on top of the mountain. There were lightnings, there were thunder, the earth was shaking, the mountain was on fire. We cannot do it justice. We weren't there, but if we would have been there, we would have been shaking. It would have gotten our attention and he thundered forth with his voice to utter the law of God. It got their attention. It was very real. Verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God and heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable, innumerable company of angels. He begins to paint the picture that we have access to the very throne room of God to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. He's comparing ancient Israel's access to God to our access to God. Ancient Israel, who was not given a heart to understand, to us who have been given a heart to understand and by that have responsibility for the level of obedience that God expects from us. Verse 25, See that you do not refuse Him who speaks. God instructs each of us as individuals as to what we are to do to continue to change, to continue to be cleansed, never to be satisfied with who you are or what you've become today, but to continue to grow. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. The turning away from him will establish a root in you that will bear bitterness unrepented of. Verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised saying yet once more, I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Verse 28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. The grace of God has been extended to each one of us. But if our heart is turned away, we can turn away from what has been provided. We can turn away from the throne room of God and look to someone else to teach us and direct our lives. Again, if you're like me, you can look at your own life and you can see evidence where that has happened. Again, this year, I needed Passover again because I sinned. I succumbed to temptation. I had a problem that I had didn't resist. All of us needed Passover again this year. Final scripture, Romans chapter 8. I had it in my notes. Go back through the first three scriptures that we read. Read it slow, the prophecies of the end time. Read it slow and place yourself in the picture and ask yourself, what that impact is going to do to you. How much faith do you have in God? Romans 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, 
but delivered him up for us all. If, if the Father went to that level, if Christ went to that level, what is it that they are going to withhold from us so that we are cleansed to the level of being able to function in the family of God? But it always comes back to what is your choice? What's my choice when faced with the unexpected? When faced with the traumatic, what will we do? How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercessions for us. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? What will turn your heart from God? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? I'm reading through them quickly. Take time to go through this. Make it real for you. Examine yourselves in this. As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Paul speaking, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The root of bitterness The study of it is scope is wide. It covers the entirety of our calling. The temptations and the dangers confront us every single day. I bring all of these things up because as we near the end of this age, each of us, more personally, are going to be tempted to establish a different purpose a different route, and it's going to be by your individual faith that you can see it through. It's going to depend on the root that represented the joy that was in Christ that will be able to see us through. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Brethren, we have one more opportunity to sing praises to God on this, his Sabbath day. So if you'll all please stand with me, take your hymnals, turn over to page number five in the older hymnal, that's page number 26 in the newer, five in the old, 26 in the new. Following this hymn, we will be led in the closing prayer by Mr. Mike Anderson. So page number five or 26, Turn, O God, and save me.
Thank you, brethren. Now for the closing prayer, Mr. Mike Anderson. Following, we'll have local announcements. The Lord, our loving Father, Almighty God, we do come before your throne at the close of these services, Father, to thank you once again for allowing us to meet in peace and safety of this home. Thank you for the fellowship that we share, not only here, but across the many states, for all of the blessings that you pour out on us every day, Father. Help us to truly consider those, and we do, we do thank you, especially for those on this Sabbath. And Father, help us to understand the message that was brought to us today, that these are the end times, and the words that are, are spoken to us through your, through your Bible, through the scriptures that we read, are very true, and they can be very profitable if we put them to use in our lives. We need to truly examine ourselves, Father, always daily and make sure that there is no root of bitterness that can actually keep us from the very kingdom that you have laid before us through the hope. So, great God, help us to study your word. Help us to truly consider the times that we're in. Help us to strive to match that character of Christ in all things that we do. Especially, Father, help us to flee from this world and not certainly be conformed to it, but be transformed transformed by your words of truth. So, Father, we do ask for your dismissal. We ask for your blessing on all that we do and on all of our studies and all our diligence. We thank you for your mercy and your love now. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.